How about this? Why don't we start off with this foundational fact? The foundational fact is this. The fact is this. God is not trying to fix us. God is not trying to fix us. When God looks down at Sharon, when God looks down at me, when God looks down at you, he's not trying to fix us. He's not trying to make us better. How do I know? Well, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says this, anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. Do you get that? God's not interested in fixing the the old you. He's wanting to give you a new heart. He's wanting to give you a new life. He's wanting to change you from the inside out. In fact, I'm firmly convinced that many of us have missed the whole point of Christianity. The point of Christianity is that God is not trying to make us better. You're saying, Randy, why is that? Well, because you you were born with a sin nature. And that sin nature condemns you. It condemns me. And if our sin nature is not dealt with, we have no hope. When I think of Christianity today and and all the different voices that are out there, it reminds me of whenever I was a kid. Before I I discovered the opposite sex and realized how awesome females and girls were, my first love was electronics. Uh, I don't know if you know, back in the 80s, I'm sure I know I'm dating myself, they had this thing called a boombox. Remember those? Right? And the bigger, the better. Right? Tammy never had that. She was too poor. She had to listen to the AM radio. Right? But the rest of us had boom boxes. And, and, and my, my, my love, the thing I love looking at was, ever heard of Crutchfield Magazine? Anybody? Crutchfield Magazine? And I used to get the Crutchfield Magazine, and I'll, I'll just go, and I love car radios. In fact, my first car, the whole back deck, I took it out, and I put nothing but speakers so that you could hear me for three miles before you saw me. I mean, I just loved electronics, and I just loved me. Well, I needed a new boombox because my old boombox, what I used my boombox for was to record American Top 40. Anybody else do that? The American Top 40, and I want to record it. And, and my old boombox was eating all my cassette tapes. Some of these kids today are going, what is a cassette tape? It was just eating and chewing up my cassette tape, and it wasn't making good uh, tapes for me to play on my cool radio, right, to go with my 1972 Volkswagen, four-door Volkswagen, right? We'll just leave that there, okay? And so I was looking at Crushfield, and, uh, and the real good boombox that I really wanted, it was like $200, and I was like, I can't afford $200. I'm, I'm just po. I can't do this. But then I saw they had this one for $35. And it was everything I wanted. It had the dual cassette tape so you could make a tape to give to your friends. I mean, it was, and it was big, you know, because again, size matters, right? We'll just leave that there. So I, I was like, man, I, how in the world is this thing $35? And then I saw the little word beside it, refurbished. It was a refurbished phone box. I was like, oh, it's good. It's got to be good. It's great. great." So I ordered it, $35. And here comes my big boom box. And I put it there. It worked for two weeks. And then it started eating tapes just as bad as the old one did. Why? Because the thing obviously had a problem. That's why it was sent back to, to Crutchfield. But rather than taking the guts out, rather than fixing it, they just refurbished it. Well, this is what I think about many of you. Many of you, you just want God to refurbish you. God's not interested in refurbishing your marriage. He's not interested in refurbishing your family. He's not interested in... Ref- he wants to do a complete and total overhaul. He wants to make you new on the inside and out. And so that leads us to this truth, and the truth is this. We can't enjoy the resurrection of Easter Sunday without first enduring the death of Good Friday. We can't enjoy the resurrection of Easter Sunday without first enduring the death of Good Friday. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4 says this, Christ died for our sins. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day. Now, if if Jesus did like most of us, he would have skipped the death. He would have skipped Good Friday and would have gone straight to the resurrection. But notice, Jesus didn't skip the painful death. He didn't skip skipped the cross. He went through the death. He died a painful death so that he could get to the resurrection on Sunday. You're saying, Randy, what has that got to do with me? I know Jesus has got had to die. What's that got to do with me? Well, notice what Romans 6, 5 says. It says, if, underline that word if, if we have been united with Jesus in a death like his, then we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like that. Do you get that? He's saying that our sin nature has to die in order for us to live. By the way, that's why so many of us are struggling. 
You're trying to refurbish your sin nature. You're trying to fix your sin nature. You're trying to make your sin nature better. And the sinful you has never died. And guess what? That's why you keep failing. And so you're saying, Randy, how do I know? How do I know if my sin nature has died? How do I know if I've in, it, it, gone through the death of Good Friday so that I can enjoy the resurrection of Easter Sunday? How do I know? Well, read with me if you would. In Romans chapter 6, beginning with verse 3. And this is what he says in Romans 6, 3. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. He says, Or have you forgotten that when we were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, we joined him in his death? For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. Verse 5 says, Since we, were, we have been united with him in his death, we will also be raised to life as he was. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. For when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. And since we died, with Christ, we know we will also live with him. Mm. Love that. Did you get that? Did you see what he said? He said, if we want to make sure that our sin nature is dead, if we truly want to enjoy the blessings of the resurrection of Easter Sunday, then notice number one, we must experience a cruel death. We must experience a cruel death. Go back to Romans 6, 4. It says, for we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. Now, do you remember what, how many of you have seen a water baptism? You know what I'm talking about when I'm talking about people get baptized in water. Do you remember the symbolism? You see, the water baptism is that we do in churches today, it's very symbolic. What does it mean? When, when people walk toward the, 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 the pool, then guess what? That's a symbol of them coming to Jesus. When they walk into the water and they go down, what is that? That is a symbol of their old you dying. When they come back out of the water, what is that? That is a symbol of them getting a new heart and new life. When they walk out of the water, what is that? That's a symbol of them walking with Jesus all the days of their life. But do not miss the symbol, what it meant. When you go down in the water, that is a symbol of God killing the old you. You understand. Don't miss this. For us to be saved, the Holy Spirit must take our sin nature and drown it. Notice what 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says. It says, we have all been baptized into one body by the Holy Spirit. That, that sounds like a nice, sweet verse. No, he's talking about the Holy Spirit grabbing your sin nature, putting it underwater, and drowning it till it dies. You're saying, Randy... That's mean. Randy, that's violent. Randy, that's unnecessary. Oh, I disagree. Because of this fact, the fact is this. Our sin nature cannot be saved. Our sin nature cannot be saved. Notice what Romans 7, 18 says. It says, I know that nothing good lives in me. That is my sinful nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't. What's he saying? He's saying you can't help your sin nature. You can't encourage your sin nature. You can't protect your sin nature. Parents, are you listening to me? You want to know why some of your children are still lost? You want to know why some of your children are going to bust hell wide open? Why? Because you've been protecting their sin nature. You've been encouraging their sin nature. You've been trying to help their sin nature and all you can do to a sin nature is kill it by the way that's why some of you have failed that's why some of you are still struggling because you're trying to you're asking god to help you make a sin nature better you're asking god to try to help something that god refuses to help you do understand self-help is no help at all you're saying but randy why does god got to be so cruel to quote the great theologian taylor swift why does god got to be so mean because of this truth the truth is this god must nuke our sin nature for us to go to heaven god must be cruel he must be harsh he must be mean he must be violent why god must nuke our sin nature for us to go to heaven why because revelation 21 27 says this it says nothing evil will be allowed to enter into heaven but only those whose names are written in the lamb's book of life what's he saying he's saying we must never forget that god is holy 
That means he's free from sin and he hates sin. Sin. While God loves us, he cannot tolerate our sin nature. And until we deal with our sin nature once and for all, all of our goodness matters nothing. We have no hope for heaven. Your children have no hope for heaven. We, your grandchildren have no hope for heaven. Your neighbors have no hope for heaven. Until we deal with our sin nature, we are hopeless and depraved. Many of you know my wife, Jennifer. She grew up in the church. She was in church before she was born, and she was in church the whole time. She did the vacation Bible school. She taught vacation Bible school. She did all the things. And and by the way, one of the reasons why I was so drawn to her, because she she acted like a preacher's wife even before she was a preacher's wife. She was a good girl. In fact, when I fell for her, she was teaching our preschool class in our vacation Bible school. But many of you know her testimony. About five years ago, she realized that she was trying to put lipstick on a pig. She was trying to put diamonds in the snout of a swine, and she was not saved, that she had never once dealt with her sin nature. She was trying to fix that which God wouldn't fix. And all of her prayers, all of her crying out to God was accomplishing nothing. Why? Because she had never killed the sin nature. God had never killed her sin nature. And all of her righteous deeds, all of her good deeds, all of those vacation Bible school, all of those children's things meant nothing because her sin nature was still alive and well. And so my question for you is this. Has God annihilated your sin nature? Not patty caked it. Not encouraged it. Has God annihilated it? Will you let your sin nature die so that you can live? Why? Because if we're going to go to heaven, if we're going to experience the good Friday that we need to experience, then we must experience a cruel death. But notice, secondly, we must suffer a complete death. We must suffer a complete death. Romans 6, 6, go back to it. It says, we know that our old sinful selves was crucified with Christ. Now, notice what he didn't say there. Notice he didn't say our fearful selves were crucified. Notice he didn't say our drunk selves were crucified. Notice he didn't say our lying selves were crucified. Notice he didn't say our sexually perverted selves were crucified. No, he said our sinful selves. What's he saying there? He's saying the Bible teaches that all of our sin nature must die in order for us to live. All of our sin nature must die for us to be saved. I was recently counseling with a lady, and she kept saying, Randy, this prayer thing's not working. And I was like, what do you mean? She says, well, I keep asking God to kill this, and I keep asking God to kill that. I keep asking, what was she doing? She was picking and choosing what she wanted to die in her life. But she had her pet sins over here that she really liked. She had those sins that she always liked, that sin of gossip, that sin of lying, that sin of jealousy, that sin of envy. She didn't mind those. She liked those. She liked being a little B-I-T-C-H when she wanted to be, and she didn't want God to mess with that at all. It's so that she was picking and choosing. And then she had the gall to tell me that prayer didn't work. Can I share with you a fact? The fact is this. God won't save part of us. God won't save part of us. Romans 6.13 says, give yourselves completely to God. Underline that word completely. Why? Because God's not interested in fixing the, the parts of your life that give you heartache. God's not interested in fixing the parts of, of your life that causes you pain. He insists on killing it all. He wants to kill even the sins we like. You see, I, I've noticed that many of us only want God to kill our consequences. We only want God to kill the stuff that causes us heartache. We're not interested in Him dealing with with the cause of our problem. And that leads us to the truth, and the truth is this. Half-hearted commitment is no commitment at all. Half-hearted commitment is no commitment at all. God says in Revelation 3, 15 and 16, I know all the things you do, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were one or the other, but since you are like lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Now as you turn your notes over, did you get what he said there? Did you hear what he said? He said that partial surrender is disgusting to God. You surrendering a little bit of your life here and a little bit of your life there, that disgusts God. Why? Because it doesn't do anything. It doesn't deal with the core problem. It reminds me of 2 Kings 17, 41. It says, they honored the Lord, but also worshiped their idols. You know the story there? It's so cool. Evidently, some new people had come into the Holy Land, God's special land, God's Israel, Jerusalem. Some new people had come in there, and they were all worshiping their idols. 
Well, because they were in God's holy land, God wanted to make sure they understood that he was God. He sent lions in there to attack them. And the lions were killing them. And they got scared because of the lions in their lives. And so they were like, help us, help us. And so uh, they, somebody sent a priest in there and taught them how to worship the God of the Bible, to worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and, J- and Jacob. And guess what? So they said, you know what? We'll worship him, but we'll also keep our idols. What do they want? They didn't want to surrender to God. They just wanted the lions out of their life. You say, what's that got to do with me? You don't want to surrender to God. You just want your pain to lessen. You want your discomfort to lessen. You want your kid to quit laying down in Walmart. You don't want to teach your kid to follow the Lord. You just want him to quit embarrassing you in public. Why? Because you're refusing to turn to God fully. I have found that most of us, we just want a little bit of Jesus. We want just a little bit of Jesus. We don't, we don't want a lot. We want a little bit of Jesus. And guess what? Half-hearted commitment is no commitment at all. And so my question for you is this. Have you surrendered it all to God? Not just, part, not just the sin that you don't like. Not just the sin that embarrasses you. Not just the sin that makes your pants too tight. Have you surrendered it all to God? Your sin nature, your heart to God. Why? Because I'm afraid for some of you, Jesus is getting ready to spit you into hell. And so if we're going to experience the resurrection on Easter, we've got to go through the death on Good Friday. And so that means we must endure, endure a, a cruel death. We must suffer a complete death. But notice number three, we must have a confirmed death. If we want to make it to heaven when we die, we must have a confirmed death. If we want to enjoy the, the blessings of Easter, we must have a confirmed death. Go back to Romans 6, 7, and 8. It says, for when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. And since we died with Christ, we know that we will also live with him. What's he saying there? He's saying, you ain't got to have a hope so salvation. Far too many of us got this hope so salvation. If somebody asks us if if we're really saved, we're, I guess so. I hope so. You do realize I hope so salvation ain't much of a salvation at all. And we can be sure that our sin nature is dead. We can be sure that because our sin nature is dead, we're going to heaven. You're saying how? Well, first of all, because of this fact. The fact is this. We know we're saved by our attitude towards sin. We know we're saved by our attitude towards sin. 1 Peter 2, 24 says this. Jesus personally carried our sins in his body on the cross. Thank you, Lord. So that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. So you want to ask yourself, you were saying, Randy, am I saved? Am I really going to heaven or am I going to be one of those people that spit out into heaven? How do I know? Well, what's your attitude towards sin? Has God changed your heart toward your lying? Has God changed your heart toward your selfishness? Has God changed your heart toward your gossip and your envy? Has God changed your heart toward your fear? Does it disgust you? Has it been broken in you? Do you hate what you used to do? I think of an alcoholic that I had the privilege of meeting about 12 years ago. And before I even met him, his wife had prepped me. Yeah, You know, wives are helpful like that. She had come to me and she said, Now, preacher, I have been trying my trying and trying and trying to get him to quit drinking. I have, I have kept sex from him. I've guilted him. I've sent him to counseling. I've sent him to therapy. But preacher, no matter what I try, nothing stops him from drinking. I said, Well, how about this? Do me a favor. Just be quiet. Stop talking to your husband about drinking. Just let me spend some time with him. And I spent time with him. You know what? Known the man for 12 years. Never once talked to him about alcohol. Never once brought up drinking on my own. But you know what I did talk about? I talked about Jesus a lot. I talked about the Lord. I talked about our need to be saved, about God killing the bad in us and, and giving us a new heart and a new life. And that's all I talked. I didn't talk about alcohol one bit with him. And I still remember about six years later, by then he was my Sunday school director. By then he was one of the leaders in my church. It on his own, he brought it up, not me. We went somewhere and, and it, there was nothing wrong with him drinking. It was per- perfectly permissible. God doesn't say you can't drink. He says don't get drunk. And, it was, and he didn't touch a drop. It sat there in front of him all night. And he came up to me and he says, I can't believe this. He says, that's the longest alcohol is set in front of me that I didn't touch it in my life. I said, well, what do you think happened, brother? He said, I just don't want it anymore. What happened there? I thought he was saved before, 
but I knew he was saved after that. Why? Because his attitude toward alcohol proved that he had been saved. And that leads us to the truth because, you know, it's not only we know we're saved by our attitude towards sin, but also notice this. We know that we, we are saved by our new life. We know we're new, saved by our new life. Look what Colossians 3.10 says. It says, you become a new person. I don't like that phrase, new person. Well, you become a new person. This person is continually renewed in knowledge to be like its creator. So what do we know? What's he saying there? He's saying we know our sin nature's died. We know that we're saved. How? Because we're becoming more and more like Jesus. Let me ask you something. Are you more like Jesus now than you were six months ago? Are you more like Jesus now than you were a year ago? Are you more? Because some of you have been sitting in this sanctuary. Some of you have been coming to this church, and I ain't seen a difference in your life. You're still the same sorry person that you were when you walked in. You're still struggling with the same mess that you've always struggled with. And so I wondered, are you becoming more and more like like Jesus because the way you know if you're saved is because the way you become more and more like him. Take it from his own words. He says in Matthew 12, 33, a tree is identified by its fruit. If a tree is good, its fruit will be good. If a tree is bad, its fruit will be bad. What's he saying? He's saying we got to honestly assess ourselves, not by our opinions, not by our feelings, but we got to honestly examine our heart according to Scripture to see if we're becoming more and more like Jesus. Why? Write this down. Do me a favor. Write this down on your sheet. What's on the inside always comes out. What's on the inside always comes out. And so your insides re- reveal themselves by the way you act. And so please remember this. Please remember, we must have fruit of biblical goodness or the fruit of God's discipline in our lives to be saved. We must have fruit of biblical goodness or the fruit of God's discipline in our lives to be saved. Hebrews 12, 8 says this, if God doesn't discipline you as he does all of his children, it means that you are illegitimate and are not really his children at all. He's saying if you're not consistently bearing biblical love, like love is patient, love is kind, love is not envious, love is not proud or rude. If you're not consistently bearing fruit of biblical love, then you must be miserable or you are not saved. Do you hear me? Because this is why I'm concerned. Some of you brag all over social media, to your friends, to your family. You brag about your sin. You will put on social media that which is blatant biblical sin, and then you're just bebopping through life, happy and go lucky as you go. Are you kidding me? You cannot be saved and biblically sin and not be miserable. Because it says if God's not disciplining you, then you're not one of his. I don't discipline your children. I discipline mine because they're mine. So so I think of what 1 John 5, 13 says. He says, I have written this to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know you have eternal life. What did he write? We see it in 1 John 3.10. He says, we can tell who are children of God and who are children of the devil. Anyone who does not live righteously and does not love other believers does not belong to God. What's he saying? He's saying if goodness and love's not consistently coming out of you, then it ain't in you. Are you hearing me? If biblical goodness and love is not coming out of you, then it ain't in you. And if you ain't miserable, if God's not disciplining you, God's not punishing you, then you are not saved. So let me ask you a question. Has your spiritual death been confirmed? Has your spiritual death been confirmed? Do you have the fruit of your salvation? Now you're saying, Randy, in closing, you're saying, Randy, how, how do we make sure our, our sin nature still? How can I, I want to examine myself. I want to examine myself to see if I'm truly a believer. If my sin nature has died, then what do I do? Well, look at your sheet. Our sinfulness must be confronted. I know there's a silly parenting style that says that when your kids sin, you walk off and you leave them alone. That's not biblical. Biblical parenting means you confront the sin in your kid's life because that's what our Heavenly Father does to us. Leviticus 19.17 says this, Confront people directly so you will not be held 
guilty for their sin. So guess what? That's my part. Today, you have been confronted with your sinfulness. You have been confronted with your sin nature. The Bible teaches that someone must share the gospel that talks about how much you need Jesus. But notice, secondly, our sinfulness must be confessed. Our sinfulness must be confessed. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins to God, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all right, wickedness. Do me a favor. Right beside that, that's my part. That's your part. That's what you got to do. It's my part to confront you with your sin. It's, it's your parents' job. It's your Sunday school teacher's job. It's your vacation Bible school teacher's job. It's, our part, our, it's their job to confront you, but your job is to confess your sinfulness. What does it mean to confess? It means you agree with God. You stop arguing. Can I tell you something? God's sick and tired of hearing you tell what a good person you are. You're not. But what's the third part? Sin must be confronted. Sin must be confessed. But thirdly, thirdly, our sinfulness must be covered. Our sinfulness must be covered. Romans 4, 7 says, What joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sins are covered. Yes, what joys for those whose record the Lord has cleared of sin. By the way, you can write down beside it. That's God's part. It's my part to confront you. It's your part to confess it. It's God's part to cover it. He doesn't do it because you deserve it. He doesn't do it because we, 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 uh, we're awesome and everything. He does it because of his amazing grace. So can we ask you a question? We were on the golf course, and he just brought it up. Randy, I don't know if I'm saved, and I've been in church all his life. Married a godly girl, had godly children. And he's like, Randy, I just don't know if I'm saved or not. So we talked about it. And you know what he did? He, he, he skipped the first two parts. He went straight to the, to the hey, I want, God, I want God to cover my sin, but he didn't want to be confronted. And he definitely never confessed. If you're awesome in every way, why do you need to confess your sinfulness? So with every head bowed and every eye closed, have you done that? Have you skipped? Have you jumped to the end? Are you banking on Jesus covering your sin when you've never been confronted and you've never confessed? Many of you were talked about how Billy Graham recently died, the great evangelist died. Do you know what he said about you? He said that 50% of all church people were lost. 50%. If you're sitting beside somebody right now, one of you is lost. Based upon what he said, what he experienced. And I can see it. Yeah, we're all about singing about the, uh, the resurrection and we're all about, yay, abundant life. But have you gone through the cruel death because you've been confronted with your sinfulness you have an opportunity to confess you're saying Randy how do I do that I don't know how to do that well in just a second I'm going to pray a simple prayer and if you'll pray this prayer with me to God then, then you can be saved
changed you from the inside out. You're saying, well, Randy, what do I need to do? Do I need to get baptized? No, the first thing you need to do is you need to tell somebody. That's the first thing God says. When something like this happens, anytime a miracle takes place, we need to tell somebody. Just like the shepherds said on that first Christmas morning. We need to tell somebody. So you could tell me, you can tell somebody that you came with. You can announce it on Facebook. I don't care. But you need to tell somebody what happened to you today. Let me pray for you, dear God. Thank you so much for loving us. Lord, I just lift up those who, who prayed that prayer with me. Give them the courage, the strength, the joy, Lord God, to share what happened to them. Lord, even if, like my wife, they, they, people thought that they were saved, people believed that they were saved, Lord, give them the courage and the excitement to share with people what happened to them today. Because, Lord, they may be the one encouragement somebody else needs to pray that prayer as well.